are going to turn now to the dangerous flat flood emergency in Florida. Areas known to flood quickly turning into rivers. The airport in Fort Lauderdale is still shut down. The tarmac and the runway looking more like a lake out here. Easy flutter, treating your prima for a ding and underwater. Before you know it, we'll be out to sea. She's an easy flutter. Although we've spent hundreds of millions, our infrastructure is worse than that of third world country. We've got fourth world Right for our destruction. Never forget it. Ooh, it's pathetic. Building high rise after high rise. Even though the high tides come in again. aren't able to bring fuel to gas stations because Port Everglades is literally underwater. No! <laughs> How am I supposed to go to Scarlet? I heard Billy Corbin laughing under that, and this is one of the problems Billy Gill has with you, Corbin. He thinks that you enjoy that Miami is falling apart at every turn. And now Fort Lauderdale as flooding engulfs our airport, makes gas hard to come by in South Florida. Uh, before we get to Billy Gill and his objections hey. to uh, Billy Corbin being uh, pro flood, a joy, a joy kill. Well, I, OK, Dan, I was invited on and I was try I thought I was supposed to be pro flood and Billy was anti flood. And then he told me and I don't know if I'm supposed to reveal this. He's been rooting for one of these floods for decades. Absolutely. What? Right. It's like, I just I hate to get all taxi driver on you, but you know, someday a real rain's gonna come and it's gonna wash all this scum away. But wait Dan. a minute, what happened? You guys before the show were discussing pro flood, anti flood, yes. and you ended up with an opinion that shocked him because you confirmed what his beliefs are about you, that you're rooting for bad things to happen to Miami? I'm I'm not actually rooting for bad things yeah. to happen to Miami, but like where where are we? Meaning, like, what choice? What choice do we have at this point? We're we're building ourselves into this apocalypse. Like, what happened? I'm sorry. Can we just look out the window here? This beautiful new studio. I mean, some of the viral video from the Miami flood because it was the Miami flood and then the Fort Lauderdale flood. There was kind of the one-two punch last week. But one of the the big dig of Miami, what they're calling connecting Miami, this one billion dollar signature bridge that the good news is FDOT, the Florida Department of Transportation, was on track to end it, uh, this construction, to complete it at the end of 2023. It's now been delayed till the end of 2027 and possibly even later. And it turns into a third world shit show out here in a drizzle, let alone in a record Rainstorm. I mean, you you can watch this video. It's incredible. It's a drizzle in Miami, but what hit Fort Lauderdale was not a drizzle. That yeah. would have flooded any place. And Fort Lauderdale Airport is in a prime area that's problematic. The video coming out of Fort Lauderdale, Billy, is something we've never seen. I was not aware that that area could flood that way. Well, they took a runway at the airport. It was originally three runways with about 5,300 square feet of concrete. And they turned it into 8,000 square feet of concrete. So they poured, <laughs> they poured more concrete. And where does water go on concrete? It doesn't go anywhere. And, and it just goes where, whichever direction the concrete goes in. And in fact, they built at Fort Lauderdale International Airport a six-foot cliff, Dan, on the new uh, runway. It's a six-foot cliff that just is basically... They built a water slide, is what I'm trying to say, at the Fort Lauderdale Airport. You could have said it much quicker that than that. That sounds fun. I mean, it's it's fun if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna like 
be in the lost city of Atlantis, but like it's the water pours down onto US one and then pools at the bottom as a water slide would. It goes down into the pool, and that pool is the runway at Fort Lauderdale International Airport, which consistently ranks at the top of the most vulnerable airports to climate change, along with the Miami International Airport, the Key West International Airport, and the St. Pete Clearwater International Airport in the Tampa Bay area. Why are you laughing and why are you smiling? All of this... He likes this. That's what I'm telling you. He he told me he was rooting for floods. He likes this, It's a figure of speech. I'm building an arc, and if when you're in the arc business, when you're in the arc business, floods are good for business. Story arc, line. or that's Noah's what I'm wondering. Arc. Like, is your apartment or house just filled with random animals? <laughs> two, two of each, Billy. Two of each. You shouldn't be smiling though, because I'm troubled. I'm. I find myself like this is something that's weighing on me with a palpable anxiety. I've always loved Damn. this place, and it's becoming less and less livable. We're all. We've always been third world. We've always been sort of the Caribbean. We've been like an extension of the Bahamas. But what's happening right now is terrifying. My my, my people are. I think by their by our nature mi- migratory. I'm a native Floridian and a lifelong Miami Indian, and yet I'm always. Prepared prepared for a place to be unlivable, either for my people or for any people, and we're ready to just hit the desert for 40 years and eat unleavened bread and just move on to the next thing. But I will tell you, how are we supposed to care when the people who are the so-called leaders of this community and of this state don't give a shit? If we can continue, you look at, at what's going on outside your studio, you look at, what, at what's going on at Fort Lauderdale International Airport, these are symbols of the, of the intersection of hubris, of man's hubris, and climate change. We are developing ourselves right into Mother Nature's hands. So if I don't laugh about it, what am I going to do? Just cry all the time? We just keep building more concrete where there should be mangroves, where there should be green space, where there should be a place for water to run off. The water's running off on us. It's pooling under us until we drown. That's what's happening. What am I supposed to do about it? Cry every day in a corner in the fetal position? Where's the leadership? Well, on a book tour, Dan, where do you think the leadership is? The leadership's on a book tour and picking fights with Mickey Mouse. Okay? That's what's happening. You want to hear? Let's hear the latest from, uh, from Rhonda. Ron DeSantis. Then to live under the same rules, pay the debt, pay the taxes, all that stuff. Oh, but come to think of it, now people are like, well, there's, what should we do with this land? And so, you know, it's like, okay. Kids, I mean, people have said, you know, maybe, maybe have a, another, uh, maybe create a state park, maybe – Try to do more amusement uh, parks. Uh, someone even said, like, maybe you need another state prison. Who knows? I mean, I just think that the, the possibilities are, are, are... He's reading from Possibil- notes. Nazis are his base. Possibilities are endless. We're, we're, we're going to build a prison next to Disney and make Meadowlark pay for it. That's what we're going to do. This isn't even... First of all, this is totally irrational. His, his war against Disney has no place... It has no logical place of policy. It's not conservatism. It's not pro-business. It's not anti-regulation or small government. It's completely irrational. It's like it's like an obsession at this point. Ron DeSantis is to Disney what like Bill Murray was to the gopher in Caddyshack. Like it's just like it's, <laughs> it's just fucking bizarre. And it's not getting him anywhere. Most of the Florida congressional delegation so far is backing uh, Donald Trump for president. There was just a Texas congressman who tweeted. I just had a, uh, a meeting with Ron DeSantis, and I'm proud to hold say on, that I'm hold supporting. Hold on a second. Hold on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You haven't been respecting this. If we're going to blow the entire yeah. budget of Metal Arc Media on music uh, in order to get you these little songs. Do you guys have a house band? Like, what's happening here? <laughs> it's just the listeners and the listeners. Billy's blown the budget Give in, it up. in a couple of months for all the music around here. Continue your Give thoughts. Give it up, Andrew Streeter. Continue your thoughts on, uh, as I mentioned, Ron DeSantis. Crystal fascist. Yeah. So this Texas congressman says, uh, tweets, I just had a meeting with uh, Ron DeSantis in my office, and I'm proud to support Donald Trump for president. <laughs> it's like to meet this guy is to despise him. To know him is just to not want to vote for him. Can you explain to people nationally, we're having gas issues. Oh, Please no, try- we're not. Issues. There, it's hard to get. Ga- what do you mean we're not having gas? I, I'm, issues? Having, I'm having gastro issues. It is, but we're not. It is hard oh, for gas to no. get through the flooding. What do you no. mean we're not having gas issues? It's man-made. It's a it's a run on gas stations. It's totally unnecessary and irrational. There's plenty of gas. The problem is the deliveries have been slowed down because of the flooding. But then people start panicking and create 
a gas shortage. But if we had real leadership, who wasn't off picking fights with Disney. By the way, do you see those assholes laughing about this? This guy is making up policy as he goes along about the largest driver of economic engine in the state of Florida. This guy's going, basically he's showing his ass. He's showing, he's telling the whole game. It's like, I don't really, I'm just going to make this up and pick fights. with. What is this? I don't understand what this is. And if he would just go on television and say, hey, don't go to the gas station unless you need gas. This isn't a hurricane. No reason to top off. Just do act normal and everything will be fine. In fact, it's going to be the, the, the Wawa Chongas out in Hialeah hitting each other with chongletas for gasoline. The gas thing really only should last like three days. But everybody's freaking out because they're seeing how long. the Like when you wait in line and you see people filling up the red containers with gas, like that's not what's happening right now. This is going to take care of itself. Just calm down a little bit. Just act. Just relax. Just act normal. This be is chill, so dumb. Like Billy. Tranquilo, tranquilo. What's going, Tranqui what's going to happen <laughs> happen when things actually get bad? It's not. Uh, this is. This was not. <laughs> this is why I laughed, Dan. This, this was not a horror. I mean, yes. 24 inches of rain in Fort Lauderdale is yeah. something unexpected. I think it, was, it was almost 26 inches. They got like more, like a third of their annual rainfall in like a day. But it wasn't a hurricane. It's no. not. It's one. It wasn't one of these bad storms. No, it wasn't even a named storm. It was just a rainstorm. But this and one, this one's bad, but bad like a hurricane because it was like three or four straight days of water. Where a hurricane would kind of be in and out. You don't have the wind damage, but the water damage was probably equivalent yeah. to what a hurricane would be, if not more, because it was nonstop. Right. And that was the same thing with Andrew. It like stopped. It like came on land and just stopped and and this just lasted just it was blowing through but it was like non-stop it felt like and, i'm and disturbed just, by how often he laughs while delivering i'm this telling news. you he I'm wakes sorry. up and it's like where's sorry. the disaster let I, me start I, researching I, I, like, four what do you mean, where's the disaster just look out the window what do you mean where's Billy, the disaster we're Billy, living in the disaster i've been defending you're you. like batman without the cool gadgets <laughs> Like you're just you looking know, for these things, but you're like not actually I, fighting anyone with gadgets. I, I got to tell you, I was I, I watched when I watched the Batman last year. At the end, I'm kind of figure out, and I'm like, for first of all, the Gotham City was totally Miami. It was totally Miami in that movie, and it, it even ended in a publicly financed sports venue arena. By the way, <laughs> this is where it ended. That was getting flooded. By the way, and then I, and then I when it was over, I'm like, shit, am I Batman or the Riddler? I couldn't figure out which. Which one I was, well, like you, to Miami. Hmm. You you have been the Joker. You're somebody who's laughing <laughs> at the anarchy around us. You're you can't stop laughing. What are we supposed to do, Dan? Nobody's solving these problems. What are we supposed to do? I don't understand. What is the alternative here? It's not going to get better. It's just yeah. going to keep getting worse. You uh, you you somehow moved like from from like below sea level to sea level. <laughs> like, but you're like, laughing at where is... I've placed these studios. Yeah, it's hilarious. Weird. It's yeah. hilarious. Billy has to hate this. It's thing. hilarious. <laughs> oh no, it's hilarious. What are you kidding? I bought a I bought a kayak just to get here. This is awesome. I love it. The positive, Dan, guys. Let's look. The positive is this. Like I live in Westchester. It'll be waterfront soon. You know what I mean. Oh, yeah. And then the property value will go up. So, like, but yet there is high ground. Yeah, that's that's gonna be very valuable. Glass right? half full, guys. How, the glass is all overflowing. It's, oh, way yeah. too, it's way too full. We're all drowning in everything that's overflowing from the glass. We're going to be back in a second. We've got yet more from Florida's governor here. In the meantime, we need more voicemails complaining about Billy. The number is 786-505-9842. 786-505-9842. Billy, you're so right. He's enjoying this. It's not just that he's a killjoy. He's enjoying the apocalypse. Apocalypse party. My place. Let's do it.
South Beach was proud last weekend. South Beach was loud last weekend. That was right outside my house. Billy Corbin was there with a chicken, a giant costumed chicken. You were protesting. What were you doing in the streets? I was surprised to see you show up with a chicken. I wasn't there with the chicken. I was just filming. But the chicken happened to be there wearing a Joe Carollo wife beater. Oh, hold on a second. In God we trust. And it's that God that's been protecting me and is going to protect me so you that's can't defeat the, me. That's not the one. Uh, He's a wife beater, I don't really know what the, was a chicken doing there in a Joe Croy wife beater, I swear to God, because this was a protest that I was there filming of uh, Republican State Representative Fabian Basabi, who is uh, being called uh, Miami's own George Santos. He's also known as Fabian Cunan, and he's been a ubiquitous figure around South Beach and New York social scenes. He was a socialite. He was on a reality show on E! Entertainment Television, and he tried to make himself happen. He had like, hired a publicist and put it out there that he was the male uh, Paris Hilton, but it never quite happened. So he just went around town being really unpleasant to people, arrested for DUI, public urination, verbal abuse of police officers, civil theft he was sued for. Um, he was drunk on top of a, of a car on Washington Avenue. This was in 2016 when he was 38 years old because he wanted to make a Quote, fabulous entrance to Club Twist, a very popular uh, gay club where he's arrested for disorderly intoxication. 2020, he was arrested for strong arm robbery. We talked about it on this show of a a woman's cell phone. He threw it and stole it from her on camera, flew it, threw it into the ocean uh, and then fled the jurisdiction and had to be uh, tracked down by the U.S. Marshals um, Fugitive Task Force. Then in 2021, he tried to run for office but was disqualified because he lied about his address. He didn't even live in the city where he was running, which he had to by law. And now, as a newly reelected Republican uh, uh, state representative who ran as a moderate Republican that was pro-choice and pro-LGBTQ plus rights, um, on his first day on the job, basically, in January in Tallahassee, celebrating the inauguration of Ron DeSantis, he's now under investigation for smacking his legislative aide. Nazis are his base for smacking his legislative aide at a party in front of witnesses and then making him go stand in the corner in front of, like, all of these people at this party. And so this guy's voting record, mind you, despite running as a Republican, a stay-at-home father, he's married to the heiress of the La Perla lingerie fortune, his voting record has been to the right of the Taliban. He has voted 100% with Ron DeSantis. He has voted against uh, drag queens you rights have to against children. slow down. Nazis are his base. I can't keep up with you. You're losing your own breath, and we haven't even gotten to the three most homophobic bigots in leadership in Florida yet. Can we do that, please? Let's do a top three, baby. Number three. Number three is Republican State Representative Randy Fine. <laughs> And they're the ones that are saying this definition applies to them. Well, if it means erasing a community because you have to target children, when well, damn right we ought to do it. I just don't think you have to inherently say because you're lesbian or gay that you want to target children. I find that statement to be offensive to them. The gaslighting is so real. It's so profound. Randy Fine saying the quiet part out loud. Yes, in fact, they are looking to erase the LGBTQ plus community in Florida. You have the um, the Joseph, one of the Joseph Goebbels of Ron DeSantis, Christina Peshaw, tweeting a waving goodbye emoji when it says that that LGBTQ plus families are fleeing the state of Florida because they don't feel that the free state of Florida is welcoming to them or giving them or their children and their families uh, any rights. And more importantly, he says if this community is going to target children, that they should be disappeared. The problem is, is that they're not targeting children. But you know who is, Dan? In the end of 2020, the Florida Attorney General published a two-year investigation into the Catholic Church in Florida, where they found 97 priests, at least 51 of whom are still alive, had molested children in this state. And the state legislature has done nothing to do look-back legislation that would allow them to be prosecuted for their real crimes against children outside of the statute of limitations. Number two. Number two. Webster Barnaby. We have people that live among us today on planet Earth that are happy to display themselves 
as if they were mutants from another planet. This is the planet Earth, where God created men, male, and women, female. I'm a proud Christian conservative Republican. I'm not on the fence. Uh, this guy is calling the LGBTQ plus community mutants, demons, imps. I got to tell you right now, he might not be on the fence, but uh, I'd love to see the skeletons in this guy's closet. I'd love to know what this guy's up to, because I, and I think we're going to find out someday, too. OK, but that's cryptic and reckless. Number one. Number one. We're back to where we started, Dan. Fabian Basabi. And thank you. And <laughs> here's an interesting thing you have to know about Fabian Basabi is that despite the fact that he ran as a moderate Republican, married to a woman with a child, Fabian Basabi has, well, let's play the audio. My name is Fabian Basabi. I'm running in Miami Beach. And I'm here to the tell other, you that I'm a, I'm a Republican. Okay. And I'm a gay candidate running for office in Miami Beach. I don't know if you heard that, Dan. He said, I'm a gay candidate running for office in Miami Beach. This is at a 2021 uh, LGBTQ plus candidate forum in Miami Beach. Fabian Dasabi is known to people in this community for the last 30 years as an out man, living as an out man. Um, but it's clear that he's living a double life, both politically and socially. And uh, but this man has been an absolute villain to a community that he calls uh, his own. And that's why he has earned the title of the most homophobic, anti-gay bigot in the Florida legislature and Miami's own George Santos. So it feels like city of Miami taxpayers and the owner of Ball and Chain and other properties around Miami, Bill Fuller, they are spending millions of dollars to produce a Netflix series just for, just for me, for like an audience of one. The trial of Joe Carollo has begun. So Joe, Joe is being sued. Actually, she's being sued for several things, but the first of which is a $2.5 million lawsuit for him selectively targeting a business owner that he doesn't like because he exercised his First Amendment right and held a fundraiser for his political uh, adversary, Joe's political uh, adversary. And uh, this trial uh, just started last week in Fort Lauderdale. But because of the, the rains and the flooding, they they... Court was canceled on Monday, and I'm thinking, like, maybe Joe's right. Maybe. In God we trust. And it's that God that's been protecting me. And, 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 and she is. That God is indeed protecting uh, him because uh, court got canceled on Monday, and then they decided, we're going to move the show to Miami. And so it's right here down the street from the studio in the uh, uh, Wilkie Ferguson uh, courtroom here, federal court, and man, I went all day on Tuesday, and the testimony was sensational. It was my favorite episode of my favorite novella, Roy. I mean, there was th three police chiefs testified. So there was over 100 years, by my estimate, 103 years combined law enforcement experience, all testifying to the same thing, making the plaintiff's case that Joe Carollo was selectively enforcing the laws, abusing his power, and targeting these business owners. What's funny, while Francis Suarez is off in New Hampshire pretending to run for president, Joe Carollo is on trial right now for doing the opposite of what Francis Suarez says the Miami miracle is. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm, I'm working the board for the first time I, uh, here. The power and is... Straight to your head now. Yeah, the, you're no, excited, no, totally, aren't you? No, but I but I forget about it. I think I think uh, uh, I'm gonna. But I could I could get used to it. Don't get me wrong, oh boy. right? Uh, but I will tell you. So we heard from former Miami police chief uh, George Kalina. Uh, they introduced his bombshell February 21st, 2019 email uh, to then city manager Emilio Gonzalez in response to an email from the day before from the city attorney Vicky Mendez. I have to read you some excerpts. The city attorney is requesting that Miami police personnel and other departments conduct new site inspections at the direction of a city commissioner. The addresses in her email target one particular business owner, which gives the impression that the city is selectively targeting his businesses for new investigations. The concern is that this request through the city attorney may amount to an unsanctioned and unlawful exercise 
exercise of powers beyond the limits of his legislative power as a city commissioner to intentionally cause harm to a business owner. As such, my department's actions under the resolution may be in violation of the Code of Ethics Ordinance. No shit. It's just... what. Well, Furthermore, this is selective enforcement against the business owner's properties using city ordinances. This may be deemed an indirect usurpation. Ooh, usurpation. Oh, I'm so oh. glad you're not Stu Gatz oh in this God. situation. Usurpation. Oh, wow. I just I like saying usurpation. Of the administration's power to interfere with the operations and procedures of various departments, including the Miami Police Department. If that didn't prove the case in and of itself... Uh, there was another police chief. This guy was an assistant Miami police chief. Then he became the police chief at in the city of Doral, a.k.a. Doral Zuela. And what's amazing about this guy, Richard Blom, is that he was hired to be police chief in Doral by Joe Carollo, who was then the city manager. And he actually likes Joe Carollo, respects him, thinks he did great things for the city of Doral before he got shit canned for attempting a mutiny. He got fired. Joe got fired by the mayor of Doral years ago. And so this guy, Richard Blom, thinks that Carollo is terrific, but got hired as his chief of staff when Carollo was elected to City of Miami Commission. And he wrote a letter. Again, this is way back July 1st, 2019. This is what he writes. He goes, my role as your chief of staff this past year has been confusing, frustrating, and disturbing. And he goes on to list various problems, including Joe's refusal to accept his advice on law enforcement matters because Joe pretended to be a cop for like 15 minutes before he got fired for putting a racist KKK parody ad into the uh, mailbox and lockers of black police officers. And so he's like, what do I need your 37 years of law enforcement experience? I was a Miami-Dade uh, police uh, uh, public uh, service inspector for 13 minutes. But this guy Blom writes... I've witnessed your profanity-laden rants when I've greeted people in the District 3 office who, for whatever reason, were not welcome there. One was a city department director, and the other individual was a representative of the Miami Marlins. He cursed out some guy from the Miami Marlins. He goes, I do my best to keep up with your persona non grata list. Joe is famous. He's this sort of Nixonian, Trumpian character, and he has an enemies list, and I am proud to say... Me and the chickens are way, way high on that list. Congratulations, Billy. And finally, he writes in the second to last paragraph, he goes, the one area that I received your wholehearted support was in the area of researching properties owned by Bill Fuller. He goes, he goes, this is just one of numerous occasions you notified me on a Friday to come and work on the weekends to do this type of research uh, in order to focus on this one individual. Once again, proving the case contemporaneously. But the highlight was definitely... Art Acevedo, the guy who was the police chief of Miami for six months before he got fired for calling out what he referred to repeatedly in his testimony as the three-headed monster, which is Joe Carollo. He's a wife, be her wife, be her. Yeah, that's Joe Carollo. Commissioners Alex Diaz Laportia and Manny Reyes. Um, his stuff, oh dude. He, said, he testified that this is the first time I've seen a city manager, city attorney, an entire city engage in a pattern or practice of political retribution. So on cross-examination, the defense attorney goes, so everyone in Miami is corrupt? And he goes, no, I never said that. He says, in fact, a majority of the people of Miami are victims of this defendant, Joe Carollo. And he says what's happening to Fuller is just the tip of the iceberg. I fear for the people of Miami who want to live their lives but are at the whim of this petty wannabe dictator. It was such a good show. Um, the attorney asked him about his famous statement um, where he said that Miami, the city, and the police department were run by the, quote, Cuban mafia, end quote. And Acevedo said, yes, and I stand by that statement. That's why we're here today. I mean. I mean, I remember when they uh, I mean, played the Godfather music. When, when, and he threw the, the current police chief who was an assistant police chief at the time, he threw him right under the bus. He said straight out, he testified repeatedly that, that Manny Morales was just a stooge of, uh, of Joe Carollo. He's a wife, be her wife, be her. Yeah, that's Joe Carollo. And he testified that Joe Carollo repeatedly asked him to arrest peaceful protesters. But here's my favorite thing that happened. It's not my favorite thing that happened. It's just a disgraceful thing that happened. But as Billy Gill will say, you know, I just I relish in in, in this. But um, the former city manager Emilio Gonzalez and Richard Blom, the former police chief of Doral, the former assistant police chief in the city of Miami, uh, 
and Carollo's chief of staff for the first year and a half he was elected city commission, they both testified to the following. Gonzalez said that Carollo uh, pointed to a mural, and this is a mural on a Bill Fuller property, that he said, quote, had too many black people in it because he didn't want the residents of Little Havana to think it was becoming, quote, a black neighborhood, end quote. And then Richie, uh, Richard Blom testified that, quote, every time we passed this mural on 16th Avenue, Carollo complained there were too many black people on it, it and it didn't represent the community. So when I come on this program and I tell you that Joe Carollo is a racist and an anti-Semite and a wife beater. He's a wife beater, wife beater. Yeah, that's Joe Carollo. Don't take my word for it. Take the under oath sworn testimony of the former city manager of the city of Miami, of Joe Carollo's own personally hired police chief and chief of staff. And next week, Roy, we are going to hear from one of Jero... From one of Jerome, from one of Jerome, from one of from one of Joe Carollo's ex-wives, we're going to hear right from her about what it was like to be married to Joe Carollo, and it sounds a little something like. He's a wife, be wife, be yeah, that's Joe Carollo. But he's got God on his side. In God we trust, and it's that God that's been protecting me. You're goddamn right, Meatball. <laughs> In the free state of Florida, you have bodily autonomy. You don't have to get vaccinated. You don't have to wear masks if you don't want. But when it comes to women's health care and women's bodies, they can't just be in a room with their doctor making important decisions about their bodies and their, their health with their families. They now need the entire Florida legislature and the governor of Florida in the room with them, forcing them into torture, forcing them into pain, forcing them to carry not simply unwanted children, but children that may not have the ability to ever have life or take a breath of air for more than seconds at a time. This is the free state of Florida. Welcome to DeSantis. The free state of Florida, most free of any land. A proud phallic peninsula, our home DeSantis stand. Natasha, Deputy Director, Florida Watch here with an emergency update. In the middle of the night, our cowardly leader, Governor Ron DeSantis, signed SB 300, Florida's extreme near-total abortion ban that limits care to a time before many even know they are pregnant into law. According to recent polling by the University of North Florida, 75% of Floridians oppose government overreach that strips millions of us of our bodily autonomy, setting a dangerous precedent of ambitious politicians making decisions for private citizens about our personal medical decisions. DeSantis has a pattern of signing unpopular laws out of the public eye. During this session alone, the chicken approved a massive giveaway to the insurance industry that will limit your ability to hold them accountable. And dangerous permitless carry, allowing anyone to carry a loaded concealed gun in public without training or a license. Think about that. Imagine the clumsiest, most absent-minded, or just plain hot-tempered person you know. Yes, even them, carrying a gun without any training. Why did he do this? He passes these harmful policies that nobody asked for in order to pander to his right-wing extremist base that could give him an edge in the Republican presidential primary. It's not actually about governing Florida. Just ask our friends down south. In the meantime, know that abortion at 15 weeks is currently legal. This new, more extreme six-week ban will not go into effect until 30 days after the Florida Supreme Court undermines our right to privacy in the Florida Constitution. So, if you or someone you know needs an abortion, reach out at 1-800-230-PLAN or visit abortionfinder.org. Also, support Florida abortion funds at floridareprofreedom.org slash abortion hyphen funds. Watch this space for more updates.
The disenfranchised and the woke cry when their books are banned. A Christo-fascist paradise here in Decentistan. This is a really heartbreaking story, Billy, and I wanted to make sure that the audience got a face, a voice, a uh, humanity around some of the things that are happening in Florida with our terrible abortion laws and some of the unintended consequences. Deborah Dorbert didn't think she would ever need an abortion. She wanted to have a child. She wasn't thinking about what abortion laws would mean to her when she was pregnant, and she's joining us now with her doctor, Dr. David Berger, because her baby uh, was diagnosed right before Thanksgiving with Potter's syndrome. And if you don't know what that is, that is usually fatal before birth, but even after birth, you can have uh, a, an asphyxiation with the baby minutes or hours later. And she made the difficult decision of deciding to terminate a pregnancy she did not want to terminate. So she's with us now. And I saw her on Morning Joe talking about the pain, the anxiety, the depression of all of this. So, Deborah, thank you for sharing your story with us. I know this isn't easy. Uh, can you take us through what it is that you were thinking when you're in physical pain because you're bringing to term a baby that you had decided that you wanted to terminate because of the horror of this and the doctors and the lawyers would not allow it because they didn't want to break Florida law. Thank you again, by the way, for joining us. So for physical pain, it was just seeing I had no amniotic fluid. There wasn't a cushion for the baby so the baby pushed up on all body parts, my ribs, um, my hips, um, the round ligament. And I mean, it was excruciating pain. Um, and obviously I couldn't take any medication for that because I'm pregnant. Um, so I endured a lot of pain um, in my legs and my lower back. And I'm still feeling that pain now. It's, taking some time to recover from that. And just, you know, my mental state, I fell deep into depression and anxiety and just, you know, my days were, I mean, I still had to get up out of bed because I had a four year old to take care of, but there were times I didn't want to get out of bed just because the pain and just my mental state wasn't good. This is a, an unspeakable horror. Doctor, I have this right when I say um, that the baby uh, was going to be or was born with no bladder and no kidneys, correct? Yeah, so, and, and that's what makes the amniotic fluid. So in addition to that, amniotic fluid is what helps the lung tissue develop. So the asphyxiation that was talked about, that was the sudden death reason because there were no developed lung tissue, the air sacs, et cetera, the flexibility of the lung tissue to breathe out, that wasn't there. So that was the immediate issue. But of course, without having kidneys, you know, one can't filter out toxins, one can't, um, you know, eliminate. And so, you know, it was kind of like a double whammy in, in a way, but, you know, it was so obvious that this was going to be the outcome for, for this family um, as to what happened if intervention didn't take place, but yet it didn't. You are doing this because why? Because I can imagine that it hurts to keep going over this again. To bring change um, and to help any other woman out there going through it. And I'm not the only women going through this right now. There's so many out there that we just don't hear the stories. You don't hear how these laws affect um, all the women. So hopefully to bring change and to anyone else going or going through what I went through. Deborah, thanks again for, for doing this. Um, last December when you made this, you and your husband made the very difficult decision to uh, have a preterm induction. What happened? What did your doctor tell you when you said we, we come to peace with this, this is what we want to do? Um, when 
Well, after he confirmed the diagnosis that it was Potter syndrome, he explained what Potter syndrome was and that the babies don't survive, that it's a life-threatening condition. Either the baby would be born stillborn or only live a few minutes to a few hours after. Um, and so after he explained all that, we, you know, we talked about how hard pregnancy, just a normal pregnancy is on a woman. I mean, we go through so many changes and our hormones change. So we talked about it and we kind of weighed all our options. Uh, he told us whether we got preterm or went to full term that the baby would pass. And so after we discussed all that, um, he had left the room to let me and my husband take in the information. And we just decided to um, get preterm induced because we knew that the mental state and the pain was going to be too much for me. Um, so that's when we decided to be preterm induced. And when you told the doctor about that decision, what did the doctor tell you? He was supportive of it. Um, he agreed with us that's, you know, that's a good option for us because um, he's seen this more than once, Potter syndrome. But he said because of politics and the new law that's out, he had to reach out to administration to get the okay. Yes, he can allow me to get pre and term induced or not. So when we left that appointment, he was working on the back end of getting a hold of administration to get that okay. And almost a month went by because we found out right before Christmas that we weren't allowed to get pre term induced and that I had to go to full term. Doctor, uh, the law that was uh, relevant at the time was the 15-week law. Um, the question is, is why was Deborah not an exemption? I mean, it seemed like, like under the law it would be a textbook exemption. Why, why was she not permitted? Yeah, um, the reason according to the law <clears throat> is that, yes, a, a – a, a, Pregnancy could be terminated early in this situation up until viability. That's the actual term that's in the law. Now, viability is a standard medical term that means the age that a fetus could survive outside of the womb, which is anywhere from 22 to four weeks. I've seen a 23 week baby um, who was just born premature, um, did survive, but typically that's around it. So that by, by the time that she had made her, that they had made their decision, she was past that 24 weeks. And that therefore the term viability is what scared everybody off because, you know, we've heard that the legislator who actually wrote this bill said, oh, this was the doctors not interpreting the law right. And the, you know, viability, it was obvious that this baby wasn't going to survive. And maybe in her layman's term of what viability means, that's one thing, but in medicine, that's not what that term means. And nobody would touch it. You know, it was really sad. And so I had the opportunity, I was doing a, a, a checkup with her and I didn't know that what, when we first started the conversation, I knew she was pregnant. I didn't realize that this was happening. And qu very quickly, obviously, this conversation went from an initial congratulations on your pregnancy to, oh my gosh, this is happening. Had asked her, and again, do you have any interest in sharing this information with other people, with the country, um, because of what you're going through? And of course, no pressure, but you know, now or afterwards or whatever, if you want to tell your story, you know, we can provide a platform in order to, to make that happen. And it's just, you know, knowing that there's other cases that are happening like this, that's kind of why, you know, I, it was for me an important thing, you know, to, to share with, with my viewership and then with everybody else as to what, what could happen here. Doctor, what are the short-term or even long-term effects on Deborah's body of being forced to endure this pregnancy against her will? 
Well, you know, under normal circumstance, you know, obviously a person would be able to get pregnant again at any time they start the cycle. But in, in her situation, you know, there's a lot of stress that would have been put on her pelvis, on the ligaments that hold the uterus that normally when a baby is cushioned in amniotic fluid. And so it, it will take her body a significantly longer amount of time to recover you know, obviously there's that, but also just the mental trauma of, of going through this. You know, we know that, that it's not uncommon to have postpartum depression, and that's when everything is going well. And now we're left with, and she's left with this situation and her husband and her son where, you know, you can't put this, you know, this toothpaste back in the tube here. This is something that, unfortunately, that they're going to have to... Uh, to deal with, you know, and thankfully we're able to give her support and she has a lot of support and, you know, and, you know, and this is a quote unquote best case scenario. I can't even imagine what people with less than has, you know, has, must be going through. I'm not sure that any amount of support is sufficient. So Deborah, can you explain to us how you're coping with this? Because this seems an unspeakable trauma, not just the physical pain, but the, the emotional pain. Um, I mean, right now we're just taking it one day at a time. Um, we've had our, I mean, last week was a rough week for us. Um, I mean, we're sleep deprived. I, I mean, my husband's having nightmares and, you know, we still have those images of, you know, I mean, I held my baby until he passed away. So it is a lot of emotions to cope with. And so really we're just taking it day by day, you know, see, I'm currently seeing a therapist and I'm working with Dr. Berger to help me get through this. Maybe, but it's, it's gonna take us a lot, a long time to, go through the grieving process um because we devoted a lot of time to our son making sure that it wasn't going to affect him with his behavior and his school and thankfully we did a good job at that and he's bounced back and he's back to just being a happy kid but for mom and dad it's it's taken us some time and it's just been really hard. I've, I've heard your husband articulate anger. I have not heard you articulate anger. I've heard, I've heard grief from you when I've seen you interviewed, but uh, I, I can't imagine how angry you are about something that you probably never could have possibly imagined even so much as a year ago. And it's just something you can't imagine like unless you lost a child like it's something that someone who hasn't they can't imagine losing their child or picture any of it um, we learned that through my therapist like it's hard to describe the emotions that i'm going through right now there are days i break down crying there's are days i get angry because it's like was there anything else i could do but I know there wasn't, but it's just days I just miss holding my son and just, so it's just hard to explain the grieving process and all the emotions I feel. Doctor, so much of the conversation around abortion, for men anyway, is about promiscuity, uh, a last resort birth control method. But this is about women's health care and the options that women and their doctors have to make their own decisions about their bodies, about their health. You as a doctor in the state of Florida, do you recommend that responsible parents or adults or women get pregnant in this state? How can I, what do you what do you say to patients? I mean, what do you say to, you know, potential mothers or, or, or couples who are planning on, on procreating in this state? You know, obviously, no one really thinks about a pregnancy going wrong, you know, something unexpected like this happening, right? And 
you know, it's, it's, I mean, this is a question that has come up for people before. Am I, you know, I mean, we're hearing about, um, you know, OB residents, you know, um, physicians in training who are looking to transfer out of state because they won't be able to get the training that they need in order to perform these types of procedures. And they could, and they could go to jail for performing them. Yeah. And so, you know, you know, we're going to have a problem with, you know, most people who are obstetricians are, are, are pro-choice, you know, and so are we going to have an issue? I mean, there's communities around that there's not an OB around for a long time to even get the type of care and that could get worse. But, you know, it's a serious thing. I mean, obviously, we know that there are people, some who can fly out of state, and we know that there are people who, um, organizations that are helping support, but you have for someone to uproot their life for you know a week to go take care of all of this you know to uh, and to take their to for their body to be treated in the manner that they want to i mean i've been one since you know the very beginning of advocating for patient choice it's you know informed consent means that we weigh the pros versus cons versus the alternatives that are out there and now alternatives are being taken away and that's just completely the antithesis you know above all do no harm is the is the Oath, oath that we all took the day that we graduated medical school. I can't say that the Department of Health and the government grant, granted, um, well, I guess some of them are physicians, but <laughs> for them, they're not above all doing no harm because we see the harm that is being done here. And it's a travesty. My heart goes out to uh, to Deborah on this and to everybody else who um, and other families who uh, may be going through this as well. And it's, to your- it's just terrible. And to your point, ultimately affects us all because it will degrade and deteriorate the overall quality of health care that we all receive and the types of doctors, if any doctors, will be willing to practice here in the state of Florida. Deborah, one last question. Um, during the pandemic, famously, you know, Florida fought against vaccines, against mask mandates, all in the name of freedom and to preserve body autonomy. Does this feel like you're living in the free state of Florida? No, it does not. 